we're talking about one of the most perfect shapes in mathematics, the sphere. And we were looking at one special kind of sphere, the one sphere or the circle. But I just want to begin by taking us back to the sphere. Uh, the ancient Greeks, of course, thought it was the most perfect form that one could have. And artistically, it's got an enormous attraction because of its simplicity and beauty. But it also doesn't have a whole lot of complexity or richness, which is also very important artistically. So the thing I wanted to point out was all the spheres, the family of spheres, have essentially the same equation. It's second order equation. It's got squares. It doesn't have any first powers. And it doesn't have any higher powers. And if you just start out with one coordinate, and what it is is the square of all the coordinates of the points that lie on the sphere have to satisfy that equation. And the one is the radius of the sphere. It's one unit sphere. So if we just have one coordinate, and I call it the zero sphere, uh, it satisfies the equation x squared equals 1. And that actually is kind of degenerate, but it actually fits in with the pattern. The x squared plus y squared, that's the in two-dimensional space. That circle living in two-dimensional space satisfies this equation. That's what we're really interested in. That's what we're spending all of our time on. But I just wanted to mention that if we go higher, x squared plus y squared, every time we go a dimension higher, we have to have one more coordinate. So now we not only have an x and y, we have a z. They have to, their squares have to sum to 1. That's the 2 sphere. And it's called the 2 sphere because you need two coordinates to locate yourself on the sphere, even though it's sitting in three-dimensional space. And the basketball or the map globe is a typical two sphere. And then there's the three sphere, and you can keep going. And in fact, there's a whole branch of mathematics that's devoted to the behaviors of spheres. But I just want to mention that the three, three sphere is actually kind of important. It makes its appearance in the motion of a planet around the sun. We're not going to go into that. I think I left a copy of my book, uh, The Shaggy Steed of Physics, which actually is a whole book almost devoted to that. Okay. Um, so let me just mention again, the, ones, the, the zero sphere, x squared equals 1 has two solutions, right? x equals plus 1 satisfies that equation, but x equals minus 1 also satisfies that equation. So I handed out some graph paper, and we're going to use it a little bit. So just to get oriented, could you plot those two points on your graph paper for the zero sphere? So y is zero. There's no y coordinate. There's just x, and there's a 1 and a minus 1. So locate the x-axis. Find the x-axis. And then find plus 1 and put a dot. And find minus 1 and put a dot. Yeah, and um, feel free to uh, help one another uh, or check with one another. See if you've got it right. Matthew, you OK on that? Yeah, I think pencil. OK, good. All right. Okay, so it's, it's nice to, to know that there is a zero sphere, and it's kind of degenerate. All it's got is, are those two points. And, oh, I just wanted to, I had a picture here showing the three sphere. Well, actually, you can't see the three sphere. It's in a higher dimensional mathematical space. We're not going to go into that. just want you to keep in the back of your mind that these are not complete abstractions, that they actually have a place in the physical world. Okay, now we get to where we are spending all of our time on these lectures, which is the one sphere, which is the circle. So
So the one sphere lives in a two-dimensional coordinate space, which I've encouraged you to go ahead and think of like your computer screen uh, or a movie screen or your cell phone screen. And so here I've laid out some coordinates. And one of the things I wanted to point out was that we could, because of the specialness of two-dimensional space, you can't do this in higher dimensions. There's something very special about two-dimensional space and it has to do with the circle. It's got to do with the fact that there is this operator which I introduced last time called I. Now, those of you who are quite advanced in mathematics and say, oh, that's the square root of minus one. Well, yes, it does have a lot of connection to square root of minus one, but I think it's nice to think of it just as an operator that obeys a certain rule that moves points around the circle. So then, instead of just giving the x and y coordinates and telling you which coordinate we're on, I'm going to label the coordinates with just a one. That's the normal real line. And it's the same set of numbers that are duplicated up on the second coordinate, and I'm calling that the I coordinate as a name. That's the name of the coordinate. And then last time we said, well, when you want to address the screen, when you want to put something on the screen, you have to give the x and y coordinates, the two coordinates that pick out that point. If it was really a screen, it would be the pixel on the screen that you were picking out. But that we can also write as 1 times x plus i times y. And we can then write the coordinate as, we, we don't have to put the 1 in. We can leave it off because 1 times x is still x. So whenever you see x by itself with no i, it means this axis. And the y means this y is sitting on this axis. So let's see how that might. Uh, oh, this is Matthew. Here's our screen. We got, let's say we have a megapixel screen. It's got a million points. How many bits do we need to encode that information? Each one of those points is a string. So, 8 million? You said it's a million points, so 8 million? Because the string is We're always going to need fewer bits than the number of strings. The number of strings is the exponential explosion of the number of bits. If I, if I just have two bits, I can already make four strings. And when I have three bits, I can make eight strings. So whenever you hear strings, you know you're talking about the exponential explosion of the number of bits that sustain those strings, the number of bits in the computer register, for example. So, Alex, can you help him out? Um. We, each one of the points that we want to address, say this was a one megapixel screen, and each one of these points that we want to address is a string, that's a name. So you need far fewer bits to encode all of those strings. And here it's written right here. If you, if you have n bits, that's going to make 2 to the n strings. So the number of bits that you need to hold the information that tells you where every one of these points in is exponentially smaller than the number of points. And thank God, because otherwise you'd never be able to take any photographs and reasonably store them, because the, it would be way too much. It's very important that this million, these million bits only require a space that's the logarithm of that number, a much, much smaller number. Okay, that's just a little reminder from last time.
Now, let's get back to our circle. The circle is also a embodiment of Euclidean space. What is Euclidean space? It's a space in which the distances between two points, like the origin and a point sitting on this circle, obeys a certain rule. And that rule is that equation of the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So if I have a point on the circle, it's got an x-coordinate, it's got a y-coordinate, and it's the length of the ray or the line from the origin to the circle is 1. The rule is x squared plus y squared equals 1, and if you apply that rule to every point, it will draw a circle for you. So just to kind of embed it in your memory, go ahead and put that circle in on the graph paper. And it should go through the points you already have because you already have the x at plus and minus 1. So if you, you're going to have to figure out just by eye, just sketch in the circle because I'm not going to ask you to work out sines and cosines and things like that right now. Just feel free to sketch. You can, Gabby can draw a cake, she can draw a circle. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. And you know that this point, I hope, went through plus one. And did your point when the circle came down here and cut across the y-axis on the negative sector, did it go through minus one? Hopefully close to it. And if you had your hand calculator, you could actually solve this equation for either x or y and find y as a function of x. We're not going to do that. Um, notice something else. Notice that as the other thing that's uh, here is the angle, which we discussed last time, which is a way of measuring the distance along the circumference. And so for every angle, there's an x and a y. And all you have to do is give the angle, and you get both x and y. That's what it means to be stuck on the circle and not free to wander all over the plane. You have to stay on the circle. When you stay on the circle, it only takes one coordinate to tell where you are, such as the distance along it. And for every point, there's an x and a y. Now notice that as the point comes this way, the y values are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until they completely disappear. And the x values, which are right up here, these x values as the point moves, those x values are going to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that pattern will repeat as you go around the circle. So what Euclidean space is a space in which the distances between points obey this rule. And that rule is the equation of a circle. Here's another important fact about Euclidean space. If you look at this equation, can y or x ever get bigger than 1? Well, look at it. Uh, if x is 1, that's going to take the whole oneness that's sitting on the right side, and y better be 0. y can't be anything else if x is 1. Could x be greater than 1? No, because if it was greater than 1, it would never be able to satisfy this equation. So the value of x, when, when you put bars like this around a variable, it means that um, you're just taking the magnitude, so the sign doesn't count. So this is the absolute value. I think some of you probably are familiar with that. Adrian? What if you had... Couldn't you satisfy that equation if you had, with x being greater than 1, if y was the square root of the negative? 
say like I? Yes. So then yes. That would be another There's case. no real number that will satisfy okay. this no. equation. Oh. Yes. In fact, there there are imagine there are solutions in the complex plane. That, that, you can see I don't like the word imaginary. <laughs> okay, now that's important because we're going to learn the very close relative of this equation, which uh, is able to traverse the whole two-dimensional plane. It's not confined. It's not what mathematicians call compact. The Euclidean, the Euclidean circle is a compact space. You can't get out of it. But there are spaces like x equals y, the line x plus y equals zero. Remember that was, those were the two lines that were running at diagonals. They can stream as far as they want, as you want them to go. They're not compact. Now then, the other thing that's really quite important is the idea of rotation. So what is rotation? Well, rotation in Euclidean space and rotation in the way we're talking about it only makes sense uh, in Euclidean space. Uh, there would be ro things like rotations in other spaces we're going to find, but they have to have their own description. You can't use the same one that goes with Euclidean space. So what it is, is a rotation is a transformation of, the, of points on the, so that they always stay on the circle. So any point up here, if I want to move it around, the motion that moves a point around so that it always stays on the circle is a rotation. So if we have our original and we rotate our coordinate system by some angle, which we like to use the symbol theta for, that co those the coordinates rotate and they still are on the circle so that the lengths of the coordinate lines in this case are still one. And that is a transformation that keeps the points on the circle. So that's what a rotation is. It's a transformation of the circle that keeps all the points on the circle. Okay, now, to make, what I'd like to do next is show you the close relative of the circle, which is called, which, and, and the space that goes with it, it's called hyperbolic space, and the close relative is a hyperbola. So, I'm writing this as y squared plus x squared. There's a reason I want to put the y first, but it's, it's not, not important. So we're going to leave the circle, and we want to go to the hyperbola. And the all, only thing that we're going to change is the sign that separates the two terms. So instead of it being y squared plus x squared equals 1, in which case if you see that equation ever again in your life, you're going to say circle. And if you see y squared minus x squared equals 1 ever again in your life, you're going to say hyperbola, close relative of the circle. So let's look at a couple of things about what happens when we do that. First of all, now that we have a minus sign on one of the terms, we can have y and x get big, and it'll still satisfy this equation, where it is impossible for the circle, because you're always adding two positive quantities together so that they would blow up past the one. But if we're t subtracting, y and x can get large, and we can subtract a little bit from two large numbers and get a 1, and it will satisfy the equation. Same thing for y squared minus x equals minus 1. So, contrary to the circle, contrary to the circle, just by that change of sign, for x and y, much, much bigger than 1. So if x and y get huge, look at what happens. You can neglect the 1 compared to the y and the x if they're really huge. 
So they satisfy the equation y plus x equals 0 and y minus x equals 0, which were those two lines. So right away, without doing any calculations or plotting, we can put some penetrating vision on that equation and see that for y and x really big, it looks like two diagonal lines. So I'm going to leave the circle here. That's our Euclidean circle. No harm to leave it there. But we're getting ready to plot, to put the hyperbola in. So the first thing I want to put in are those two limiting solutions. We know that there are, that these two lines are going to be the limits of those hyperbolas when x and y are really big compared to 1. So can everybody see that? That when x and y are really big compared to 1, this equation doesn't look like y squared minus x squared equals 1. It looks like y squared minus x squared equals 0. And this is what they look like. So these are the equations of y squared minus x squared equals 1 and y squared minus x squared equals minus 1. There are four pieces. So by that change of sign from Euclidean space to hyperbolic space, the circle blows apart into four pieces. And two of the pieces fan out from the, y, the I axis or the Y axis, and two of the pieces fan out from the X axis. And they have to do with whether y squared minus x squared is equal to minus 1 or whether y squared minus x squared is equal to plus 1. So that's what they look like. See if you can sketch in, sketch in these guys and go ahead and sketch in these other hyperbolas. And also write the identification of y squared minus x squared equals minus 1 and y squared minus x squared equals plus 1 in the appropriate places just to, just to kind of fix it, get it into your, into your consciousness. Can you, can you see okay, Adrian? Yeah, right. <laughs> You got good, uh, good, good telescopic or uh, rotationally symmetric eyes. So notice that the hyperbolas touch the circle at the one points, and it's also highly symmetric, very symmetric. Now, something dramatic has happened because of this fact that the circle has been blown to pieces. And in hyperbolic space, we have disconnected regions. So if you're on this hyperbola, there's no way you can get to the others. So this space has become disconnected. And all of that happened because there was a sign difference between the two terms in the circle equation. <coughs> this disconnection of hyperbolic space is really important. And the connectedness of the circle is equally important because the connectedness of the circle says that I can rotate this object and always stay on that circle. I don't get disconnected. 
But I can't do that in hyperbolic space. I can't rotate up here and get down here. I can't cross these lines. And why is that important? Well, it turns out that something so simple as this equation that describes rotations in Euclidean space, when you change that sign to hyperbolic space and no longer think of one of these coordinates as another spatial coordinates, but instead think of it as time, this picture matches the way time and space work in our universe. And it's the why no longer we would not think of it, we're no longer going to think of it as a space coordinate, we're going to think of it as the time coordinate for something that can move in one dimension. And the fact that you can't cross these uh, asymptotes is connected with the fact that you can't go backwards in time. We'll see more about time and hyperbolic space, but that's a prelude. Okay. I think that's about where I'm going to stop, and now we're going to ask some questions and have some discussion. Um, so let me just first of all say um, that's Euclidean. Now I'm going to change the name of the coordinate. I'm going to call it t instead of time, but it's still the same equation. How's that for a lousy intersection? <laughs> How's that for a fat point? Okay, see if you can get this. We want to talk about what a rotation would be in this hyperbolic space. So what it is is a transformation in which the points stay on the uh, geometric shape. So let's look at this. So here's a point and I want to move this point say to, to here. I can move this point any place I want in the two-dimensional plane but I don't want just any place. I want to stay, I want it to be hyperbolic, so I want to stay on that hyperbola. So say I move it to here. Well, this is kind of like a rotation. Here, back to our circle here, which we still have sitting here, if, if we had a point here, that would just be a rotation of this point to here. And of course we can keep going on the circle, but we can't keep going here. We're gonna run out of we're gonna run out of space to go because we're hitting the limit of that x equal of the t equals x line. So a hyperbolic rotation is a motion of this point of a point on the hyperbola and the rule is, so here's, this is like the corresponds to the, I'm going to ask you to now stop thinking about the circle for a minute, just we're looking strictly at the hyperbola here. This is our radius. 
This is playing the role of what the radius was playing in the circle, just like when we rotated to here. And you were very happy to see that the radius you could see is one on the circle. Yes, that's what it's supposed to do. But this distance is the distance from the origin to this point on the hyperbola. That also is an invariant. That is supposed to be equal to one. Well, how can that be? Well, it, it can be because t squared is bigger than x squared, and so the difference between the two is going to be one. So this would be the t coordinate, and this would be the x coordinate. And that's very possible because we have that minus sign to subtract it off. So what has, what's just like when you rotated on the circle, when you rotated on the circle, the x and y values had to shift and change so that the, their squares would always sum to one. So the x's would get smaller, the y's would get bigger, and so forth. That happens here too. The t's, in this case, have to get bigger faster than the x's so that when you take the difference between the two, you get the one. If you did this on your calculator, it would work out. Um, I'm going to, does anybody have a tab open to Wolfram Alpha? Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see uh, if you can try this. Wolfram Alpha is pretty good at disambiguating human sentences. You don't have to have real strict syntax. So see if you can write plot. Plot t squared minus x squared equals 1. Four. T equals one, two, three, and X equals one, two, three. I have to confess, I haven't done. I haven't done this, so I hope it works. It's up there, it goes to straight line. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. What's, can you tell me what's wrong with this? I did it wrong. We're, we're, what's the range we're trying to cover? We're, we're trying to cover from minus 3 to 3, not 1 to 3. Okay, good. And uh, now try it for minus one. T squared minus x squared equals minus one. Okay, so you see that for the two choices of minus one and plus one, you get these branches. You get both sets of hyperbolas.
Now, in Euclidean space, we, we worked on a circle that had a radius that was one unit. But you know we can have lots of different radiuses. We can have lots of different size circles. Um, the same, so the more general equation is x plus y squared equals some number like r squared. And the same thing is true in hyperbolic space, but there's a special significance to, to what would be the so-called radius. And I'm going to use the Greek letter, Greek symbol tau for that. So what that would do is give us a whole family of hyperbolas, uh, just like we get a whole family of circles. Now, if we're sitting, well, let's, let's, uh, I'm going to have to erase this now. What I want to do is look at where we are in T is going to be time, and X will be space. So we're now in a one-dimensional world of space, but the world of space and time is two-dimensional. So all we can do is move along one direction. So we're, you're, you're like a bead moving on a wire. You can't, you can't get off. We, we're not, Y is out of the picture here, just only one dimension. Uh, so what does a line represent? A line has an equation like t equals u times x. Why did I use the symbol u? Does anybody have an idea why I chose that symbol? Or, or maybe v I could have chosen for that symbol? V, maybe V would be a little more familiar. Um, think of your car driving along a one-dimensional road, and X is telling you where you are on the road. Jack? Would V be velocity? Yes, V is velocity. So, so this is like what we're looking at is a motion in time, like your car driving along a road, but we're not just taking snapshots in time. We're, we're actually plotting the whole thing out in both space and time. So maybe this is Floyd, and this is Roanoke, and maybe you were driving at a constant speed so th this tells you the time, if you left Floyd at time zero and traveled at the constant velocity v, you would get to Roanoke at time tr, where tr is v times times the The time to get to Roanoke is the distance of Roanoke. Uh, well, the time to get to Roanoke would be the distance to Roanoke divided by the velocity. But, so the distance to Roanoke is the velocity times the time it takes to drive there. So this two-dimensional picture where we have got time, we brought time in. So I had to push Y out. I'd say, go away, Y. We don't need you right now. You're great when you want to have X and Y in Euclidean space, but right now we're looking at what happens if we just have one spatial coordinates of, of, of that, and we have time. So 
this is the, so a straight line in the time space plane is a trajectory. Here's another trajectory. This one's going at speed, a different speed. Which one's going slower and faster? So think about it. So each one of these straight lines in the time space plane is a trajectory. Your car is going along one of these lines. Um, if I get, if it takes longer to get to Roanoke on one of these lines compared to another one, which trajectory is going faster? Is the V1 trajectory going faster or the V2 trajectory? On this one, it takes a much longer time to get there. If you can follow my rather squiggly line here. So here's the time. So here's, you left Floyd, we go at velocity, this velocity, we get to Roanoke at this time. When you go at this velocity, you get to Roanoke at this time. So I think you can all see this is the fast one. And the, the more this line lays down, the faster you go. How fast do you think you're going when it's parallel to the x-axis? We've had that word from our previous lecture, but you'd have to be going infinitely fast to get there. Now, how fast can all objects move in the universe as far as we know? There, has been, there are no exceptions to this that have ever been discovered. The speed of light? Speed of light. So don't worry about going infinitely fast here. You're never going to have to face that problem, at least as far as we know about the physics of the world at the present time. So... Look at this again. Uh, so if the speed of light is the maximum speed that anything can go at, there's some line that lies at some angle and it can't be any steeper than that. And in fact, this is the line that says C times T equals X. Or if you like, T equals X over C. C is the light speed. So those lines if we, often what people do when we're working with the speed of light and it's constant, we just say make it one. Let the speed of light be one unit. One uh, and so if that's the case, so we make C equals one, then this line is t equals x, or t minus x equals zero. So these lines, which we already knew from our work with the hyperbola, these lines turn out to be the trajectories of light particles, photons. So. <coughs> Uh, 
I'm sorry, this is t minus x equals 1. If you wrote 0 there, fix it. It's t minus x equals 1. Um, and in fact, for this, yeah, so a photon that takes off is going to be running along this line. So these lines that separated the different regions of the hyperbola are, are lines of light. They're lines of light. Um, so these, these purely mathematical things, these things come from equations, x squared plus y squared equals 1, t squared minus x squared equals 1, or t squared minus x squared equals minus 1, they turn out to have very significant meanings, and they're simple. And yet they describe something as fundamental as important as why you can't go back into the past, into the future. You can't, you can't cross if you're up here, if your trajectory is up here, that's perfectly fine because you're moving at a velocity that is less than c. Less, less than light speed. So all of, the all of the motion that lies here, and incidentally also that lies here, because these are, th this would be, let's just extend this back. This trajectory of this particle that's moving started way back here in the past and is proceeding forward into the future. And since it's traveling less than the speed of light, it's perfectly permissible. So this is sometimes called the past, not sometimes, but it is the past. And this is the future. The past is continuing into the future. And then what are these guys over here? Well, you could call them inadmissible, unphysical, uh, prohibited. Uh, the word is that uh, this region is called time-like. And this region is called space-like. I don't know if that's terribly helpful, but that's in the physics world. These have definite meanings. They're important meanings. When you're in this physically admissible region, you're in the time-like region. When you're in the physically inadmissible region, you're in the space-like region. And you see that some interesting things happen here. If there is a point, if we go backwards in time, say we're here right now. If we go backwards in time, we'll see that there are lots of points that could have trajectories that will come and intersect us. If we have a telescope and we're looking into deep parts of the universe, we're looking at all the stars that are sitting back here. And their light is coming to us. Well, actually, they'll be, it'll be coming on, on the light lines. But we can, we can find and access the light of stars that lie in our past light cone. These, these, these uh, regions, in fact, are called uh, light cones. that are formed by the light rays. So 
all the stars are sending their light to us from the past, and that's fine. But if a star, if a star, okay. Uh, yeah, I think so. No, that's okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so for those of you who are left, let's let's try to gather our thoughts together about uh, what we've what we've been through today. So we saw that Euclidean space is very closely related to hyperbolic space. And you could get very upset and say, well, you said it's just a simple change of sign, change that, but the whole thing blew up. So what do you mean? It's it's simple, but it's not trivial. So, the first, let me just, we'll just review what we did and maybe ask, answer some questions. So, we started with Euclidean. And then we changed the sign. And when we did that, we found that we could have both plus and minus one. And then we said, since our physical, well, let me, we, we didn't say, I didn't say this. Our physical space, the space of the physical space of this room, not we don't, don't not need time, just time, is Euclidean. Rotate, you can rotate 360 degrees, no problem. Everything in here is quite Euclidean. But then I wanted to talk about time. So I had to give up one of these space coordinates and replace it with time. This is all space. Maybe the way I could make that pretty graphic actually is to use a third dimension so that here's our XY plane. This is where we, we had our circle in this plane. But now, I'm going to draw the third dimension as time. Not Z, not space, but time. So, and we're not going to do... <coughs> in the real world, we have X, Y, and Z. Three coordinates, three spatial coordinates in time. It's four dimensions. We're not going there. We're, that's too much. But we can capture the essence of time with just one spatial dimension, which is like you being in your car driving to Roanoke along a straight line. And so, we're only going to be looking at one spatial coordinate and time. So t squared minus x squared is plus or minus 1. And what that gave us was, first of all, light.
So we got light rays. Well, let's see, what do I want to do here? If the speed of light is one, then this is, this, these are the light rays. If the speed of light is C, then these are the light rays. Am I confusing you? Are you... A, so I, I keep jumping around. I have the light. I made C1. Now I'm bringing it back because I don't want all of the trajectories to be light rays. So this is a light ray. And then for ordinary particles, and this could be this doesn't necessarily have to be w one. The symbol's not important, but what's going on on the left side is important. So V is the velocity of any particle, and C is the velocity of a light particle, and V is always going to be less than C. So the hyperbolic uh, property of two-dimensional, of, of space, in this case two dimensions, has embedded in it that, that mathematics naturally has in it space and time. And it was Albert Einstein who, uh, and he was, there, there are a couple of other names that are important about this if you're interested. Um, very important name is Hermann Minkowski. Minkowski space is all about this hyperbolic space. So when you're wondering about why things are the way they are and how they could be understood and you're looking at time and space and you see that, well, we've got two coordinates just like we had two coordinates for Euclidean space, but clearly time can't be like that because you could go backwards in time if that were the case. You could rotate back into the past. And then at some point, does it just come to you? Change the sign? If you're Herman Minkowski and you're sitting there, it said, change the sign? Keep the equation, but change the sign? I'm not sure what went on in the minds of these, of these guys. But that sort of that it works. You can keep the equation and change the sign and it works. It's awfully amazing. So, um, and it's so intimately related to the circle. And when you change that sign, you get the rule that you can't go faster than the speed of light. Well, you don't get that. You get that if you do go faster, you have to jump across a line. You have to jump across a discontinuity. You have to, con you have to jump across the disconnection of the space. In other words, the hyperbolic space is sitting there and saying, I'm disconnected. Can you do anything with that? And the answer is yes, because we don't seem to be able to travel into the, into the outside our light cone. And that's what you're saying, that this is prohibited. It's, it's kind of amazing when these things just all knit together into some kind of coherent whole. Um, 
How about some questions or comments or Jack? On this reference to like space and time, I just keep thinking about like the space time continuum. That's all. Because <laughs> all this ref all this use of space and time, I just keep thinking about the space time continuum. Yes, yeah, so you should. You should be thinking that it's not space and it's not time, it's space dash time. Space time. Space time. And in the usual theories of Einstein, for example, you, w before we get into string theory and some more complicated higher dimensional theories, it's 4D. Our macroscopic universe, including the universe of atoms and molecules, which are pretty microscopic, but not getting down into enormously small things that are even way beyond elementary particles, but four-dimensional. It's four dimensions. How do we know our space is three-dimensional? And that we proceed three different directions. Uh, that's a good clue. Why did nature give us stereoscopic vision? Because we're projecting the three-dimensional world onto a two-dimensional screen that's sitting in our retinas. So we are 2D screens. I mean, our, our visual system is a 2D system, but yet it's <clears throat> taking in a three-dimensional world. One of the ones I always like is, have you ever been sitting on a chair and it's not right and it's rocking all the time? It, what, if you, what if you're sitting on a three-legged stool? I mean, a good one, not one that's badly designed, but a three-legged stool that will stand up. Does it ever rock? Excuse me? It has to put in the stool. No, no, it's not good, it doesn't. I, Adrian, I didn't hear you. I mean, if you've got, if you've got a big enough stool, it would rock. No. A three-legged stool, even if you have badly cut legs, well, I mean, it can't be ridiculously badly cut, but on a four-legged chair, even if it's a little bit off, you will feel it if you're on a good, solid, plain floor. So that says something that three points define a plane, and that's the case in three-dimensional space. But that's a simple one of uh, three-legged stools don't rock. The other thing that's fascinating about Euclidean geometry, um, it's the geometry of rigid bodies. It's just, if, if this was made out of some really s flexible material like rubber, and when I rotated it, the rubber stretched and shrunk, it wouldn't be Euclidean. So there's a really interesting connection between rigid bodies, which is what most solids are, like this table. Most solids are rigid when they're, uh, or matter when it's condensed into solid is rigid. It's not perfectly rigid. You push on it enough, you will compress even solids and you will stretch them. But they're mostly quite rigid. And rigid bodies are in a way the paradigm for Euclidean geometry. Um, questions? Any other Questions or comments? Um, one of the things that I, that I don't know if we'll have time in this series or not to cover, I would very much like to do it, um, and that is all of the wonderful mathematics that is centered around the circle. We've sort of maybe gotten halfway through it, um, I showed you the operator I. And I think you saw how that operator has this magical property of rotating anything it multiplies by 90 degrees. And that it also had the property of its square being minus one. 
And if you have the slide file, you see, you'll see that that's all laid out. That's fine, but and as you saw, we, we found that if you start with a 1 here, hit it by multiplying it by i, it rotates it up to here. If you hit it again with another i and multiply So here's i. Multiply it by i, it's i squared. Now multiply this by i, you get i cubed. Well, i squared is minus 1, and the other i snaps it back onto this axis, so this is i cubed. Multiply it by i again, you get i to the fourth, which is 1. And, if, and you just keep going around. Um, do study that and try to, uh, try to bring that into your thinking. Well, that's, as much, that's as important to know about i as that it's a so-called imaginary number. But what that didn't give you very well at all was how you get to points that are in between. Suppose I want to rotate to this point. Well, I briefly sketched how to do that, but I don't think it was adequate. Uh, the, the story behind the rotations on the circle in Euclidean space is this really important equation. Has anybody seen this before? Probably not. Okay, that's okay. Um, this is also x plus i, y, where x and y are those circle coordinates. And the e is, is the is the mathematical constant e. It's, you know, two point blah, blah, blah. And it's raised to what seems like crazy things here. It's e to the i theta. Well, e to the i pi over two is i. And maybe you'll remember this. I don't, you're not learning this very well right now, so don't worry about that, but I would like you to just think of it as a preview. There's something really important about this equation. It's all over mathematics and physics and even chemistry and computer science. Uh, it's a very important equation. I would like to be able to teach it to you before or teach you to it before uh, the spring is finished, and I would think of that as the great final achievement of our series, if we can do that. Um, and I'll, I'll end with a joke, Let's see if you can, so. So, e to the i pi over 2 divided by i is the answer to a question, which is, how many mathematicians does it take to change a light bulb? What's that? Look at this. I mean, this is a true statement here. So, what's the answer? 
How many mathematicians does it take to change a light bulb? If I take e to the i pi over 2 and divide it by i. The answer is 1. The answer is 1, yes. I figured the answer would be something like as many as available because we spend too much time <laughs> arguing over something or other. <laughs> well, save that for another one. So, what's amazing about this is that here you've got i tied up in an exponent, and here you've got i appearing as a denominator. And you put them all together and it makes one. Okay. Any last minute questions or comments? Okay, I think, I think I've sent you all the slide file so that you can use that and I'll send you some questions, problems, things to think about. Uh, hopefully later today or tomorrow.